Uh, welcome, Chief Justice, Your Honours, other distinguished guests and audience members to this, the 23rd annual WA Lee Equity Lecture 2022. For those of you who are wondering who I am, my name's Rick Bigwood, and I'm the Dean of the TC Byrne School of Law at the University of, of Queensland. I know what you're all thinking. It's, it's hard to imagine that, they've, that they could find someone who's more impressive in the looks department uh, to serve as the public face of the law school. But, uh, particularly at significant events like this, but there's a, a, a line in my appointment letter saying that they, they didn't really try to find an alternative. So, he, so here I am. Uh, on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Queensland Community Foundation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the un unceded land on which we meet this evening. These are, of course, the people of the Yaga, Yaga and Turrbal nations of Mianjin, which we now call Brisbane. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend the same respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present here this evening. I acknowledge the contemporary Queensland First Nations community who continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. It's a considerable honour and pleasure for the UQ Law School to be able to now sponsor this lecture series, as Tony Lee has had a long-standing association with the school, having been a member of its teaching and research, research staff from 1965 until his retirement in 1989. UQ Law colleagues of my vintage still recall being taught equity, trusts and succession by Tony, and they all speak with him with immense uh, fondness. I had the pleasure myself last year of meeting Tony up at Coulomb, where he now resides, at an event arranged by the university to bestow upon Tony a UQ fellowship presented by the Vice-Chancellor. I, I would also like to take a, a moment to acknowledge and thank my boss, Professor Andrew Griffiths, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Law, uh, for not only driving me to the aforementioned presentation ceremony uh, for Tony at, at Coulomb, it's very much like a, a Thelma and Louise movie without the Brad Pitt character, uh, but Andrew's been uh, very generous in agreeing uh, to split with the law school the funding uh, for the sponsorship of this lecture series on an ongoing basis. And so that was a direct consequence of the, the warm impression that Tony left with Andrew after uh, Andrew met with him just for a couple of hours in Coulomb last, last year. While remembering to thank people, I should also like to thank the Business Economics and Law Marketing and Engagement Events team for all their assistance and for working with the Queensland Community Foundation to make this event happen this evening. As always, the team's support of the law school is greatly appreciated. Anyway, that's enough uh, in the way of prefatory remarks from me. I'm delighted to welcome the Honourable Chief Justice Helen Boskell to lectern to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening, who, despite sharing a surname in common and probably other things like bank accounts, postal address and legal issue, is not to be confused with the presenter of last year's WA uh, Lee Equity Lecture. Chief Justice. Thank you and good evening everyone and welcome to the Banco Court. Um, I acknowledge all of you as distinguished guests, but particularly um, uh, note with pleasure the presence of the Honourable Margaret McMurdo, the Chair of the Board of Governors of the Queensland Community Foundation, and uh, uh, Professor Rick Bigwood, the Dean of the uh, TC Burns School of Law, uh, whose combined efforts organisationally we have to thank for organising this lecture. Um, I also add my acknowledgement to the first owners and custodians of this land in and around Brisbane, the Turbal people and the Jagra people, and uh, pay my respects to their elders for their wisdom and leadership in speaking for and looking after this land in the past and in the present. The challenge of interpreting and applying laws to solve difficult problems in the context of our ever-changing world is not a new one. The multifaceted concept of the rule of law was no less essential to the functioning society of the original custodians of this land than it is to our diverse modern Australian society. It has always required the application of wise and thoughtful minds. This evening we both honour and have the pleasure of uh, hearing from uh, uh, people of great wisdom and leadership. First, of course, we honour Professor Tony Lee, 
for whom this lecture is named. It's quite remarkable to think that we are here tonight enjoying the 23rd such lecture. Uh, Professor Lee is renowned as an inspiring teacher and an innovative thinker and lawyer, an active scholar and law reformer. Lawyers of his kind are essential to retaining the vigour and rigour of the legal system, as it is important to have an eye not only on the application of the law to the problem immediately at hand, but on the bigger picture as well. And in that context, I'm delighted to introduce Justice Roger Derrington, who will deliver this 23rd annual WA Lee Equity Lecture this evening. Now, although he said to me I should just say, everyone, Roger, Roger, everyone, I thought I wouldn't do that, um, but instead observe that Justice Derrington is similarly a great scholar, lawyer and thinker. His honour was appointed a judge of the Federal Court of Australia in March 2017, following a remarkable career of 26 years at the bar, almost 13 of them as silk. His honour distinguished himself as a legal scholar, first topping his class in his undergraduate law studies before going to Oxford to undertake a Bachelor of Civil Law with the benefit of the Sir Robert Menzies Scholarship. His honour's early mentors include the late Sir Gerard Brennan, to whom Justice Derrington was associate in 1990. A more inspiring start to a legal career can hardly be imagined. His honour was one of the leading advocates at the bar in a broad range of commercial and public law matters. He has distinguished himself as a member of the federal court and contributes to the development of up and coming lawyers in his role as an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland. Would you all join me in welcoming Justice Roger Derrington? Thank you, Chief Justice, for that very kind introduction. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, like many of you here this evening, I too am a grateful beneficiary of Tony Lee's uh, teaching, and I'm able to attest that his contagious, exuberant intellectualism inspired many young law students, including myself, to adopt more cerebral uh, approaches to their studies than might have otherwise been the case. As a teacher, Tony was uh, Tony had the rare ability to make rigorous legal analysis an exciting and entertaining, if not sometimes amusing, experience. He thoroughly deserves every accolade which has been bestowed upon him, and then some. Before I start, I, I confess that I've over-appreciated the education of my audience. Uh, my paper is called Snark Hunting, A Search for Tracing's Underlying Rationale. Outside, just earlier, speaking to many people, I found no one knew what a snark was or what the, what the literary, literary illusion was. It is, of course, to uh, Lewis Carroll's poem, a nonsense poem, The Hunting of the Snark. Now, there are a wide range of research on what the poem actually means, but in, in essence, it's a poem about the search for the ethereal, the unattainable. Perhaps it's, a search for, it's about the search for happiness. But the, as the poem goes on, it's almost impossible to find. I feel I, I shouldn't have had to have said that, but uh, <laughs> given that every, no one knew what I was talking about, uh, that I thought I'd uh, preface my speech by just mentioning that. Now, the underlying rationale for tracing in equity is a much debated topic, and it's resulted in more theories than there are commentators. For a relatively minor area of the law, it has attracted substantially more than its fair share of attention from academic theorists, each of whom vie to bring it within their particular specialty. They include the restitutionalists, I might say I refer to them as the militant restitutionalists, but restitutionalists, those who regard tracing as an inherent right of property, those who regard it as underpinned by the Roman law notion of obligatio, and those who regard it as the enforcement of fiduciary duties. The intense debate necessarily reflects a lack of juris jurisprudential consistency in the authorities, and there are myriad cases, diverse cases, from which academics can select their own uh, case to support their respective theories. Given that one might wonder why 
I give, sorry, given that, one might wonder why I would choose a, such a topic for the purposes of this lecture. A lack of foresight springs to mind. <laughs> that, and when I, when I was asked by Mr. De Groot to give it, I was aware that the nature of tracing inequity was an issue in a forthcoming appeal that I had. I anticipated then that I could make what would be my erudite judicial thoughts the centrepiece of my paper. Unfortunately, that cannot occur, but perhaps not for the unkind reasons that you are thinking. Rather, it is because the decision hasn't been handed down yet. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, be slightly constrained in what I say. Now, it is not irrational to ask, why does it matter that there be an underlying basis for equitable tracing? It is well understood as a process by which a person whose right, interest or claim in respect of property has been misapplied seeks uh, to advance a proprietary claim against different property, which can be regarded as a substitute for the original property. It may be no more than a useful tool, which applies in a variety of circumstances, and if that's the case, then there's no necessity for there to be as Justice Gagler would term it, one very big idea to give coherency or universal coherency to the topic. However, the identification of a consistent doctrinal basis is essential for transparency and certainty in the application of legal principle. Permitting a claimant to utilise the tracing process in whimsical ways, such as has occurred in, or in relation to the concept of backward tracing, uh, leaves a stain on the administration of justice. Nevertheless, as we shall see, uh, the search for an underlying rationale for tracing faces impediments similar to, similar to those averted to by Lewis Carroll in his poem, The Hunting of the Snark. For instance, it may be that there is actually no one who's suitably equipped for the task. The object of the inquiry may be completely ethereal and the paths to the anticipated outcome point uh, in many different directions. Worse still, as in The Hunting of the Snark, the moment that one thinks they have found that which, for which they've searched, it disappears. Now, if one starts by asking, what is tracing? The confusion immediately commences. As the former judge, uh, the Honourable Joe Campbell Casey has observed, the word tracing is an imprecise term, incapable of exact definition, and its generally accepted meaning has altered over time. He correctly noted that lawyers use the expression with different meanings or conceptions. And there is sometimes debate about whether the awarding of a proprietary remedy in some of the authorities occurred by reliance on it or not. So that's not a promising start. The present discussion tonight is concerned with that form of tracing where the owner of misapplied property seeks to assert a proprietary or property remedy over different property, which is said to be a substitute for the original. This is referred to by the Honourable Campbell KC as archetypal tracing, and that is a useful nomenclature. But even when one settles on what is the nature of tracing, a further dispute arises in the, amongst the theorists as to what it is that is traced. As I will discuss uh, shortly, some perceive that the tracing is of a right in respect of property, or a proprietary right, They're, they are different. Others that it is value that is traced, while still others eschew a metaphorical analysis and assert that at the end of, at the, end of the process, uh, the person seeking to trace acquires an entirely new right. In other words, that theory postulates there is in fact tracing doesn't exist at all. So what, uh, what divides the commentators mostly concerns the identity of that which justifies a party's invocation of the tracing process a clear articulation may provide some identification of a coherent exegetical principle for tracing more generally. The issue can be contextualised by a following example. So take T is a trustee of a trust for which B is a beneficiary. Hopefully behind me a diagram will have appeared. It has, with my artwork there. Some people are laughing at my artwork. I'm proposing to enter that in next year's Archies, and on recent form I could win. So a painting, that is a painting worth $10,000, is subject to the trust and part of the trust assets, but T, the trustee, takes it from the trust and keeps it at his own house. Uh, he sells it, and after mixing the proceeds in a bank account, buys another painting, 
uh, paying $10,000 from the account. Subsequently, T gives the painting to his friend V, who keeps it. The artist who painted the second painting dies and the value of the, his work increases tenfold. So the substitute painting is now worth $100,000. V seeks to recover the substitute painting from V's insolvent estate. So in equity, B is entitled to trace his interest through the transactions which have occurred, including through the mixed funds in bank accounts, and make a good claim to the beneficial interest in the $100,000 painting. Having had a painting worth $10,000 held on trust for him, he is now entitled to the full beneficial owner of the $100,000 painting. But the question is, what is it in the nature of B's right, claim or interest in relation to the original painting, or in relationship with, sorry, or in the relationship with the trustee that, that enables the invocation of the tracing process. As I have said, the theories are diverse. One view is that the right to trace, uh, sorry, that the right to invoke tracing in equity stems from the presumptive paramountcy which our society affords to individual property ownership. In general terms, the bundle of rights which constitute property ownership includes a right over or with respect to anything for which the original property is substituted by an unauthorised transaction. This is the approach favoured by Lord Millet in uh, the leading case of Foscott and McEwen, to which I will come. Uh, that was his lordship's favoured position, but his lordship felt bound uh, by that which had gone on previously, and uh, eventually he, he did not uh, proffer that as, as, in fact, the basis for, for tracing. A view which persists in the United Kingdom, and the one which Lord Millet adopted, and a view which also exists in Australia to some extent, is that the right to, tra uh, to invoke tracing in equity is a consequence of the trust or fiduciary obligations which a person in control of property of another owes to that other. So where T has sold the painting and cannot anymore hold it on trust for B, he is required to do the next best thing and hold the proceeds or substitute painting in accordance with the trust obligations. So the theory there being is that the right to trace is dependent upon the obligations of the person uh, in whose hands the property resists. It of course runs into difficulties when the property reaches the hands of a third party volunteer, although there are arguments which suggest that uh, if that is the case, the volunteer has only the same right or interest in the property as did the trustee. There are difficulties with that view. But anyway, that's the second major view. A different approach appears from uh, the rather excellent analysis by Dr. Aruna Nair in her work, Claims to Traceable Proceeds, Law, Equity and the Control of Assets. Her theory is that the right to trace is derived from the inherent power of one person to deal with assets in which another person has an interest in such a way as to defeat that interest and from the obligation which, sorry, and from the obligations which are attached to that power, Dr. Nair's analysis provides a solid taxonomy for the wide variety of cases where tracing has been allowed, including those where the equitable powers are non-existent or irrelevant. It also explains why some equitable rights do not gener generate a right to trace at all. I should mention that Dr. Nair's book or monograph is probably one of the most uh, thoroughly erudite and intellectually rigorous books I think I've ever read. Uh, a somewhat related view is expressed by Harvey's Bag and English in The Law of Tracing. Uh, they also present a compelling analysis of the authorities and suggest that the right to trace, in, uh, sorry, the right to invoke tracing arises from the unauthorised use of rights to acquire substitute rights and that the party, party seeking to trace inequity becomes entitled to newly created equitable rights against those substituted rights. That sounds a little convoluted, but the argument is actually fairly sound. The view advanced by, uh, in Montgomery and Lahaine is that the right to trace is not dependent upon any antecedent proprietary interests, but on the person seeking to trace having a sufficient right in relation to property, which arises from a, a trust or other fiduciary duty. The right does not need to exist prior to any wrongful dealing with the property in question, rather it may arise subsequently. And <coughs> pardon me. finally, the restitutionists argue that the right to trace is justified by the principle of unjust enrichment. 
but if I might borrow from Mandy Rice Davies, they would say that, wouldn't they? In fact, they say every aspect of law is <coughs> within the scope of unjust enrichment. I hope Justice Edelman isn't here tonight. Uh, these theories are not entirely disparate, and they tend to overlap and have similar components or emphasise different aspects of shared principles. In general, but not exclusively, most accept that the party seeking to trace held at least at one stage a right, claim or interest in relation to property which has been adversely affected by the actions of another and has been subject to some form of substitution. Now, it's impossible this evening to consider each of these theories, so I will focus on that issue which arises regularly across them, being whether the right to trace is based in the obligation of a fiduciary or the claimant's interest with respect to the misappropriated property. Uh, even within this, there is insufficient time to evaluate the debate as to the nature of proprietary rights as opposed to rights with respect to property, despite its essentiality to the coherence of some of the theories. In summary, though, uh, those who assert that the right to trace stems from a fiduciary's equitable obligation commence with the proposition that, save in the case of a beneficiary of a vested fixed trust, beneficiaries do not have any proprietary interest at all in the subject matter of their trust. Rather, they have equitable rights, which are engrafted onto the trustees' rights uh, over the trust property, and it is that which enables them to compel the trustee to exercise their rights in a particular way. So the theory goes, as beneficiaries of all trusts uh, are not possessed of proprietary interests but are entitled to rely upon equitable tracing, uh, the underlying rationale for it is not the existence of the proprietary interests but can only be a consequence of the fiduciary's continuing obligations. Now, in, in that view, which is strongly put and advanced by those who insist that there is a precondition to the right to trace of a, an anterior fiduciary duty, uh, there is a difficulty in nomenclature and uh, thought about the difference between proprietary interests and property rights. Uh, that debate rages uh, and still rages for present purposes tonight, uh, shortcut uh, or short circuit the process, and I'll simply use the expression property rights as a broad term encompassing what is known to be proprietary rights, or sorry, proprietary interests, and the interests of beneficiaries under trusts or other interests in property. So, what is traced? A debate rages in this area, a debate rages on every aspect, but it rages particularly. Uh, between the theorists about precisely what it is that is traced. Though here too the discussion is fueled by inconsistencies in the, in the uh, nomenclatures used, it is commonly accepted uh, that in the tracing process the property right neither enlarges nor diminishes and nor does it change its character as it is transferred uh, from property to property. That is so regardless of whether the property to which the right attaches is sufficient to satisfy the value of the original owner's interest or has increased in, in value. In Foskett and McEwen, Lord Millet held in relation to the nature of the right which is traced uh, that the nature will depend, that is the nature of the right in the subsequent or substitute asset, will depend on a number of factors including the nature of his interest in the original asset. He will normally be able to maintain the same claim to the substituted asset as he could have maintained to the original asset. If he held only a security interest in the original asset, he cannot claim more than a security interest in its proceeds. So if I return to my artwork and example, uh, the tracing in the, by the tracing process, B is entitled to assert a beneficial interest in the substitute painting, that is to say, when before the misappropriation took place, B had an equitable uh, proprietary interest as a beneficiary under a trust in the painting, beneficial ownership in brief. Uh, it, despite all the transactions which occurred and the increase in value of the painting, that same beneficial interest, right of, in, right of interest in the painting, in the substitute painting existed, and it didn't matter that to his interest, whether the value increased or decreased, it's merely that the um, beneficial interest uh, existed in the substitute asset. 
Now, in Foskett and McEwen, Lord Millet articulated that the thing that was transferred was value, uh, which is the subject matter. Uh, sorry, which is, and he regarded that as the subject matter of tracing, and he said it's value which you follow through the various transactions. But he was not referring to monetary value. He was concerned with the application of the tracing links, which operate to identify whether the original asset is represented by a substitute asset or part of it. And in the course of that consideration, he identified that the transmission of a claimant's property rights from one asset to, the tra to its traceable proceeds is part of our law of property, not, the, not of the law of unjust enrichment. And by this, he clarified that it is the right of property which is value inherent in an asset. In this way, value has been regarded as reifying that which inheres in an asset and which can be seen as passing into another form when that asset is exchanged for another. It is difficult to conceive uh, of this as being other than the original owner's property or proprietary right. Some of the theories about the underlying rationale to trace inequity tend to converge around this issue. At the least, it's, it is recognised that a property right which existed in relation to the original misappropriated property can be traced through transactions and be applied to the substitute asset. The legal nature of that right does not alter even if the monetary value of it or the proceeds or substitute asset fluctuates. Now, as it goes without saying from what I've said previously that this is not a universally accepted concept. Uh, Harfie's bag in English postulate that, as I mentioned before, nothing is traced. Rather, the original rights in respect of property evaporate or disappear when the property is misappropriated and are replaced by new rights. I should mention uh, many people here might know Jordan English and Muhammad or Jame Harfie's Bay, uh, two young wisdom boys, have written this exceptional text, uh, which is well worth reading again, uh, rigorously intellectual uh, and thoroughly researched. Now, in their criticisms, though, they say, or they surmise that the confusion in the area really uh, surrounds the adoption of metaphorical explanations for aspects of tracing, such as value and property, uh, and that that presupposes that there exists something to trace. Now, that's a very fair comment, in a way, but given that the use of the word tracing is itself entirely metaphorical. The irony of that commentary shouldn't be overlooked. <coughs> Nevertheless, there is an acceptance, at least in the authorities, that tracing is concerned with ascertaining property, which has been substituted for the original property in respect of which a claimant's right existed and in which that right now inheres. This analysis, I would venture to suggest, is consistent with the paramountcy, which the common law and Western jurisprudence in general has historically attached to property rights. Property rights are not easily defeated by unauthorised transactions. They will survive the wrongful misappropriation of the subject matter to which they attach, and they can annex themselves in the sense of being exigible against third parties to substitute property. Such a conclusion also supports the view that it is the existence of the right as opposed to duties attached to it which underpins tracing. However, the precise nature of that right remains elusive and particularly so in the light of the focus, considerable focus indeed, in the authorities on the requirement that the traceable right be derivative upon a fiduciary duty. I'll just, I, I now I will turn to those cases or the theory about the right of tracing being underpinned by the existence of fiduciary obligations. A brief perusal of the salient English authorities reveals the evolution of the precondition for tracing of the presence of an initial fiduciary duty or relationship. In Re Hallett's estate, the point was made by Sir George Jessel, MR, uh, that where the property dealings and questions involved a fiduciary, the party whose interests had been misapplied might utilise the process of tracing provided by the courts of equity. He contrasted that with the position where the loss of the interest in property had occurred in the course of a common law relationship where the same relief was not available. There's nothing to suggest, sorry, there's nothing in his reasons which suggests that the existence of a fiduciary duty did other than provide a method by which access to the courts of equity arose. Nevertheless, this case is seen as the epicentre of the fiduciary, fiduciary duty requirement. Uh, 
It was also taken as standing for the proposition that the right to trace could only be applied against fiduciaries themselves. That latter point was rejected in Re-Diplock, where it was held that the right could be used to identify a claimant's property in the hands of a third party. There, the Court of Appeal recognised that a beneficiary of a wrongfully distributed estate could trace into the bank accounts of volunteers who had received part of that, the estate, even where the funds received had been mixed. The Court said so long as there was originally such a fiduciary or quasi-fiduciary relationship between the claimant and the recipient of his money as to give rise to an equitable proprietary interest in the, claim, in the claimant, the right to trace existed. In this way, equity could protect and enforce what it recognises as equitable rights of property, which, submits, sorry, which subsists until they are destroyed by the operation of a purchaser for value without notice. And the Court of Appeal said that, went on to say that equity may operate on the conscience, or on the conscience, not merely of those who acquire a legal title in breach of some trust, express or constructive, or of some other fiduciary obligation, but of volunteers provided that as a result of what has gone on before, some equitable proprietary interest has been created and attaches to the property in the hands of the volunteer. Now, the reference to what has gone on before would encompass the creation of an equitable interest in property consequent upon the presence of an anterior fiduciary duty with respect to it, but that is not necessarily the only way in which such an interest might arise. This appears to have been accepted earlier in the court's reasons, where it held that tracing that the tracing process was available where the claimant had established as a starting point the existence of a fiduciary or quasi-fiduciary relationship or of a continuing right of property recognised in equity. The reference to or a continuing right of property recognised in equity has been latched onto by a number of commentators as eschewing any singularity in the nature of the interest which, which might attract the right to trace. If, therefore, the right to trace arose uh, from the property interest or right rather than the, from the fiduciary duty, there was no reason why a third party recipient of property who were not bona fide purchasers for value or without notice uh, and who did not owe the owner a fiduciary duty would not be subject to the tracing rules. On this issue, the decision of the House of Lords in Foscott and McEwen is pivotal. Although the court confirmed the requirement of a relevant fiduciary relationship, numerous observations in the leading speech of Lord Millet indicated a clear preference for the view that Tracing's foundation was the existence of a proprietary interest or property right. His Lordship recognised by the tracing, sorry, his Lordship recognised that by the tracing process, a claimant asserts a continuing beneficial interest in the substituted asset as the result of a transmission of their property rights from one asset to its traceable proceeds, such that tracing is an incident of property rights. His Lordship held the beneficiary of a trust is entitled to a continuing beneficial interest, not merely in the trust property, but in its traceable proceeds also, and his interest binds everyone who takes the property or its traceable proceeds except a bona fide purchaser for value without notice. Now, so adamant was His Lordship that the underlying justification for tracing was the property interest. Uh, he was, at least in Obina, moved to denounce the requirement uh, of the existence of an initial fiduciary relationship. Uh, he said that there should be no distinction between the tracing rules at common law and equity, and that a fiduciary relationship was not to, uh, to be a precondition to applying equity's tracing rules. Now, as I mentioned previously, his, his Lordship felt that the case before him was not one in which uh, the issue squarely arise, arose, that in that case the fiduciary duty existed and so his Lordship refrained uh, from making any uh, statement other than no better comments in relation to it. Now it might be perceived that, uh, sorry, it might be that the perceived requirement of a fiduciary duty with respect to misappropriated property is merely a function of its almost ubiquitous presence in cases where tracing inequity is relied upon. Where a fiduciary duty exists with respect to property, there is often a bifurcation of interests or rights with respect to that property, which provides the opportunity and the ability for the fiduciary to effectively dispose of the property to a third party. So for instance, a trustee, executor, agent has both the power 
and capacity to dispose of title to property in respect of which the beneficiary has rights. So the occasions on which a party will need to rely upon tracing in equity will most frequently arise from those such circumstances. Thus, it may simply be the presence of an anterior, sorry, it may, thus it may simply be that the presence of an anterior fiduciary relationship is the cause of the need to invoke tracing in equity rather than a precondition for it. Now, it will come as no surprise that there is a lack of uniformity in the Australian authorities as to whether a fiduciary relationship is a precondition to a right to trace. In 2014, in CFHW and Burness, Chief Justice Warren observed that the authorities make it clear that in order to rely on equitable tracing and the subsequent constructive trust, the party seeking the remedy must show a breach of fiduciary duty. That emphatic statement was apparently a reflection of the force of the decision in re Diplock on which the Chief Justice relied. A similar view was adopted by uh, Justice Colvin in Goldus, PTY LTD and Cummins number no. four, where his honour said, putting to one side the effect of the Australian possibilities of a remedial constructive trust and the application of the reasoning Black and Friedman, there appears to be no Australian decision that has embraced the complete departure from the requirement that there must be a fiduciary relationship between, sorry, before tracing can apply on the basis of an equitable foundation. Now, in essence, what His Honour was saying was that he accepted the proprietary base required for tracing must derive from a breach of duty. The decision in Grimaldi and Chameleon Mining is an important aspect of the present discussion. Uh, part of that extremely complex and at times Byzantine decision concerned whether company property, which had been misapplied by directors, could be traced in equity. In the context of the authorities, the difficulty was that there was no antecedent fiduciary duty owed to the company from which any equitable proprietary interest arose. The company itself owned the property, which had been misapplied and transferred through the director's exercise of their powers. This absence of an initial fiduciary duty was overcome by reference to the principal in Bel Belmont Finance uh, Corporation and Williams Furniture that a misapplication of company property by directors involves a breach of fiduciary duty even though they did not hold any title to the property and a third party with knowledge of the breach becomes a constructive trustee for the company. Pardon me. So the improper transfer of property occurred prior to the company holding any separate equitable interest in it, derivative of a fiduciary duty, and there was no pre-existing beneficial interest which the authorities seemed to require. Nevertheless, the full court held, uh, sorry, went, went on to hold that it was sufficient if the property in respect of which the right is held passes through the hands of a party who owes the owner a fiduciary duty. Certainly there was express authority for that proposition and in Re Global Finance Group, Proprietary Limited, Justice McClure had held further, it is probably still the case that the right to trace in equity, but not of course at law, requires that the property being traced has passed into or through the hands of a, of a fiduciary, and Her Honour refers to the decision in Re Diplock for that. So such an analysis is supported and supportable by a number of cases where the right to trace has been recognised in relation to an equitable interest in property which arises as a consequence of a fiduciary's wrongful conduct, such as where an agent receives a bribe in the course of their agency, and the same point arises where tracing is permitted in relation to the proceeds of a payment by mistake. In these cases, there is no antecedent fiduciary relationship which produces any equitable interest in property it arises subsequently and from the conduct of the fiduciary. Now, other cases have held that either the existence of a proprietary right derivative upon a fiduciary duty or other forms of equitable duty are sufficient to generate a right um, to trace. In Rob Evans of Rob Evans and Associates against the European Bank Limited, Chief Justice Spiegelman held uh, that in order for a party to invoke the tracing process in equity, they required a duty or interest arising pursuant to the doctrines of equity. Now, that echoes the Court of Appeals observations in Re Diplock, where the court referred to the preconditions of being either a fiduciary relationship 
or a continuing right of property. So, so far I've identified <coughs> those cases which say the existence of a fiduciary relationship or duty giving rise to a prop proprietary interest is essential. Justice Spiegelman or Chief Justice Spiegelman said, well, it could be that or it could be something else. But now um, I mentioned that there are cases in which, uh, which uh, specifically reject the precondition of an initial fiduciary duty. Justice Einstein was particularly enthusiastic on this issue in Commonwealth Bank of Australia in Sailor, where he observed, there is a view that in equity, tracing can only be obtained where some pre-existing fiduciary duty can be shown, but the better view must now be that tracing protects rights of property rather than enforcing uh, fiduciary obligations. He went on to say, that view is supported by the House of Lords decision in Foscott and McEwen, in which Lord Millet in particular stressed that tracing was a process intended to vindicate rights or property rather than to prevent unjust enrichment, even though it may result in that effect. Now, um, with respect to his honour, that, that is one reading of Foscott and McEwen, uh, and it's one which is adopted by a, a number of commentators. Uh, perhaps it elevates Lord Millet's obit comments above that uh, which he actually held. But one knows, one knows that they are in a jurisprudential quagmire when you have two eminent lawyers or judges in Justices McClure and Justice Einstein, who each rely on Foscott and McEwen for diametrically opposed propositions. Uh, there, are, there are many commentators who reject the existence of a fiduciary duty from which the relevant right arises as a precondition to tracing. Uh, the learned authors of the current edition of Ford and Lee, Law of Trust, make, make it clear where they stand on this uh, topic when they observe that inequity theory, a plaintiff's proprietary claim to a traceable asset is seen as a response to and vindication of the proprietary right in the original asset. And similarly, Professor Ong, on his work on, on tracing, which also is a, a very uh, scholarly and intellectually rigorous work, so he said after discussing Reed Diplock, uh, the pronouncement of the English Court of Appeal in, Di in Diplock makes it pollutedly clear that a continuing right of property recognised in equity forms the essential foundation of equitable tracing and that the apparent insistence that, tracing, that the tracing claimant is additionally required to demonstrate that the property sought to be traced was originally held by a fiduciary to the tracing claimant is an inept attempt to describe what is, in essence, the tracing, of, the tracing claim as continuing equitable right in property. To the same effect are the comments of Professor Lionel Smith in The Law of Tracing, which is a seminal work in this area, where he also identified that the more accurate analysis of Henry Diplock is that the existence of an equitable proprietary interest in the original asset in respect of which a wrongful disposition has occurred generates the right to trace. He observed that the precondition of, of a fiduciary relationship was artificial and it resulted in courts engaging in increasingly fictitious attempts to identify a relevant relationship in order to advance the interests of a wronged individual. So here we have the learned Chief Justice Warren on one side and Professors Ong and Smith on the other side, each relying on in re diplock, again, for completely opposing arguments. Uh, none of this renders uh, the law of tracing simple. Now, certainly there are examples where it can be said that uh, equity has permitted tracing despite the absence of an, an initial fiduciary relationship. Uh, as Lionel Smith, sorry, Professor Smith observed, purchase money resulting trusts are effect effectively an example of tracing, <coughs> absent the existence of any pre-existing pre fiduciary duty. A trustee in bankruptcy can trace into the proceeds of, of a disposition of property which has been rescinded for fraud. Again, no pre-existing fiduciary duty. Same applies to stolen money uh, or stolen or the proceeds of stolen property. And there is an acknowledged right for equitable mortgagees or chargees to trace the proceeds of misapplied property, which was the subject of security. So in none of those cases, so it is said that was there a pre-existing uh, fiduciary relationship, 
and uh, those cases are said to defy any taxonomic characterisation which requires it. Now, there is doctrinal justification for the proposition that the right to trace in equity is grounded in proprietary rights, and it is uh, artfully encapsulated in an article by Professors Grantham and Ricketts, Tracing and Property Rights, and uh, they argue strongly for uh, the proposition that the right to trace is one of property and not uh, dependent upon fiduciary obligations, and they identify this as a natural consequence of the importance placed on property rights by Anglo-American legal systems. Uh, and there may be a lot of substance to what they say, and it is interesting to note that civil law jurisdictions do not have the equivalent of the right to trace. Now, despite what I've said about the authorities and commentators referring to the proprietary-based right to trace, as I've mentioned, um, there is no doctrinal purity in the cases, and the opponents of the property interest approach identify that there are cases where the right to trace has been recognised despite the claimant not having a proprietary interest or an appropriate proprietary interest in property. Uh, for instance, tracing has been permitted where a party rescinds a contract in equity for fraud. Uh, the innocent party may trace the pre-contractual beneficial title in any property transferred under the contract, including any proceeds of it. In such a case, uh, the claimant has not had any relevant initial beneficial interest in the property in question, and indeed it had intended to transfer all of it to the other contracting party. Similarly, beneficiaries of discretionary trusts have been held to, uh, to invoke tracing in order to recover any misappropriated trust property or its proceeds, as have legatees of unadministered estates. Neither have any initial proprietary interest in the, in the trust property or the property of the estate, uh, but merely a transmissible right to due administration. And again, there exists debate and much debate about <clears throat> whether those cases were truly cases of tracing or were the result of the fluidity of equitable procedures. Uh, so, but at any event, they, they generally demonstrate the unsatisfactory nature of the jurisprudence in this area. I've not tonight um, gone on to discuss backward tracing, which in my opinion is a doctrinally bankrupt concept, but its emergence will not advance the clarification of any underlying rationale for tracing. I recall uh, that in 2006, at the conclusion of one of his speeches in the Banco Court in the previous Supreme Court building, Lord Millet commented, <clears throat> well, there we are. Where we are, I am not so sure, but there we are. I think the same thing might apply this evening. And as you can see, just the fractional part of tracing discussed this evening reveals great uncertainty. And even if some consensus was reached as to whether proprietary rights or fiduciary duties underpin the right to trace, that would not resolve many of the secondary issues on which the commentators disagree. It remains to be seen whether any court can identify any coherency in this area or whether uh, that will continue to be as elusive as the snark. I appreciate it for your attention this evening. Chief Justice, Your, Your Honours, Professor Bigwood, members of the Board of Governors of Queensland Community Foundation, Kylie Ramper and Nicole Holder, distinguished guests of all. Thank you, Justice Derrington, for that fascinating and erudite presentation on the vexed and complex topic of equitable tracing. The, um, the analogy of the hunt for Lewis Carroll's mythical snark and the truth about equi equitable tracing um, was absolutely delightful. This special evening would not have happened without the support of those whom I'm about to acknowledge. First and foremost, our guest speaker, the Honourable Roger Justice, De uh, Roger, De try that again, the Honourable Justice Roger Derrington. Although Justice Derrington's artistic skills could be improved, um, a presentation of this calibre involving equitable tracing and snark hunting requires a great deal of effort and commitment, 
and His Honour is, as you've heard, a busy federal court judge and ad adjunct professor at UQ. We greatly appreciate you making time in your busy life to share all those very um, diverse insights this evening. Unlike the shark hunter in the poem, when we leave this evening, we do not need to softly and suddenly vanish away. We can find all the answers to the many complex questions raised in Justice Sterrington's terrific presentation in a pending federal court decision, which will no doubt find its way to the High Court. And uh, we will follow the, the, that particular snark hunt with interest. Personally, I hope that the great equitable principle will prevail the dirty dog doesn't win. <laughs> Although 93-year-old Professor Tony Lee was unable to travel from his Coolum home to be with us this evening, I thank him for his mighty contribution to the Legal Academy in Queensland and for his remarkable scholarship, which is why this highly regarded lecture series is named in his honour. Those of us who were fortunate to have been taught by Professor Lee, including on, the, um, uh, on, the, uh, on equitable tracing, uh, remember him with affection and gratitude. Chief Justice, thank you for allowing us to hold this lecture in this magnificent space, Queensland's highest and ceremonial court, with the magnificent Sally Gabori mural presiding over all. My next thank you is to event sponsors, Queensland Community Foundation, whose Board of Governors I have the honour to chair, the University of Queensland's T.C. Burns School of Law, and thank you, Professor Bigwood, for um, for your leadership here, De Groot's Wills and Estate Lawyers, Estate First Lawyers and Mitchell's Solicitors. Queensland Community Foundation is delighted to support this prestigious annual equity lecture series. Justice Derrington, your lecture has added an important jurisprudential credential contribution to this specialised and fascinating area, not to mention snark hunting. The concept of equity in its broadest sense encompasses a notion of social inclusion and fairness. QCF is Queensland's largest public perpetual charitable trust, with a corpus of around $115 million and growing, is committed to a socially inclusive Queensland now and forever. This financial year, QCF, through its 252 sub-funds set up by both bequests and living donors, will distribute a record $4.7 million of charitable income, enabling Queensland community organisations to work even more effectively. QCF makes it easy for you or your clients to leave a lasting legacy now or in your will. We encourage a give where you live philosophy through our Queensland regional subfunds and regional committees. QCF also celebrates and encourages Queensland philanthropy generally, not just those who give to QCF, with our annual philanthropy awards and our philanthropy in focus photographic challenge, which, cap which captures moments of kindness and generosity. Uniquely, the support from QCF's generous founding sponsors, the public trustee, QIC and Anglo-American, means that every cent of every tax-deductible dollar donated to QCF goes straight to its capital fund, providing a perpetual income stream for charitable purposes right throughout this vast state. This sponsorship makes QCF the ideal vehicle for you or your clients to establish the gift that keeps on giving through either a tax-deductible donation to the QCF General Fund from $2 upwards, or by establishing your own named charitable sub-fund. You can start a sub-fund by a legacy or as a living donor, all without expensive setup fees or onerous ongoing obligations. There are flyers on your seats. Chat to the very approachable QCF team to find out more. I want to share with you very briefly uh, something about our largest sub-fund, the Cancer Council, it began in 1999 with just $10,000 seed funding. With donations and QIC's investment skills, it has grown to over $6.7 million in corpus. It has distributed over $3.25 million so far, with another $442,000 to be given to the Cancer Council this year. And it will keep providing for the Cancer Council in this way for generations to come. Helen Fisk at Gruber and Gruber would, I'm sure, love it. 
I apprehend this audience would be concerned about access to justice and climate change and would be especially interested in two of our sub-funds, each established with an eye to the future, Law Rights Civil Justice Fund and our newest sub-fund, the Queensland Environment Fund, generously seed-funded by John Goodman, who is also here this evening. Last year, the QCF raffle at this event benefited Law Rights Civil Justice Fund. This year's raffle, to be drawn next week, of a $3,000 Paspaley um, gift certificate and a Paspaley Pearl Champagne Discovery Experience for four, generously donated by Paspaley, will benefit the Queensland Environment Fund. It will also benefit the winner. I've seen the exquisite internationally renowned pearls at Paspaley and enjoyed the fascinating and informative discovery experience. The pearls are exquisite Australian gems, but the champagne is definitely French. Please be generous and good luck. And last, thank you all for making time in your busy lives, whether in person or virtually, to join us this evening. I invite you to now join the Chief Justice, our talented guest speaker, Justice Derrington, and our wonderful sponsors for drinks and conversation outside about equitable tracing and snark hunting. Thank you.